China's bid to exert dominance in South Asia, and India's determination not to let China extend its influence further across what New Delhi sees as its natural sphere of influence, even as China warms up to Bangladesh, Nepal, the Maldives, and Sri Lanka, is a perennial bone of contention. So will China be forever our enemy, or there is some potential to befriend the Asian giant? Joining us for this session is Mr. Jayadev Ranade, Mr. Pankaj Saran, and Brigadier Sanjay Agarwal. Mr. Jayadev Ranade, a former additional secretary, research and analysis wing, is a security and intelligence expert. He is a seasoned China analyst. Mr. Ranade was a member of the National Security Advisory Board and is presently president of the Center for China Analysis and Strategy and a distinguished fellow with the Center for Air Power Studies. He is presently a member of the core group on China of the Indian Council of World Affairs and has specialized for over 40 years in analyzing developments related to China, Tibet, and East Asia and his foreign assignments include Hong Kong, Beijing, and Washington, D.C. A prolific writer, Mr. Ranade has authored four authoritative books on China, and he's also the editor of Strategic Challenges, India 2030. Mr. Pankaj Saran has been the former ambassador to Russia and India's high commissioner to Bangladesh. A former diplomat, with four decades of experience in foreign, strategic, and national security affairs. He served in significant positions within the Indian government, in the Prime Minister's office, the National Security Council Secretariat, Ministry of External Affairs, and in Indian missions in Moscow, Dhaka, Washington, Cairo, and Geneva. From 2018 to 2021, he was the Deputy National Security Advisor for Strategic Affairs under Prime Minister Narendra Modi. Joining them is Brigadier Sanjay Agarwal, Sena Medal and Bar, former Security Advisor to the Union Ministry of Home Affairs, Advisor to the Government of Seychelles, Advisor to the National Highways Authority of India, and President of the Services Selection Board, Defense Ministry. He's a visiting faculty at Premier MBA Institutes, a trainer in soft skills and a self-development coach. He is regularly invited by TV channels to speak on security issues. We are privileged to have you gentlemen here. Please begin the session. Thank you. Thank you, Parul. Thank you, audience, for being here. So without wasting any time, let's straight away jump into the topic. And there's lots to talk about. And we When we look at the map of the world and the events around us, we find from the Indian context, there are multiple hot spots. And there are some bright spots. The bright spots would include most fresh in your memory could be events around the G20 summit last year where India was able to pull through a joint summit declaration where it was not expected even when the leaders had arrived. It was a major diplomatic victory. And again associated there was India's being recognized as the voice of the global south. And of course the introduction of the African Union into the G20. And before that in the COVID time the goodwill generated by Maitri the vaccine maitri. And when you talk of it internally, the numerous successes of ISRO, the success of Atman Nirbhar Bharat, Gati Shakti, the capacity expansions involved, the rescue of numerous Indians stuck in global hotspots. All this has direct international implications and has raised the stature of India in the global playground. So with that, let us briefly ask our distinguished panelists to list out the challenges as they see them. So Jayadev sir, how would you prioritize the global landscape in terms of challenges that India faces? 
Well, the first and obvious challenge is uh, China, uh, the country to our north, uh, which has adopted for the last few years, or at least since 2012, a very aggressive foreign policy posture, not only towards us, but towards others also. But with us, it has become more aggressive. Uh, the second I would list as uh, Pakistan. We had a session earlier. Uh, I think uh, there were no conclusions as to whether Pakistan is going to be benign or not. Uh, but we need to factor in that Pakistan and China have become extremely close. They've got uh, military officers posted in each other's general headquarters in the ops directorates. These are not good signs for the future, uh, particularly with China's own agenda unfolding. Uh, the third is the squeeze that the Chinese are putting on us in economic terms and on the foreign policy front. When I say foreign policy, I mean in the international fora, they're trying to stymie our growth, stymie our expansion of our influence, and they're trying to put us down. I would look at these as the main challenges. As far as the others are concerned, the United States, etc. I think so far we are progressing well. I don't think we, have, we are starry-eyed about our relationship. We are quite pra pragmatic. But I'll leave that to, I think, uh, Mr. Uh, Pankaj Saran, who is more hands-on on that. OK, so I think that's a fair introduction to the global geopolitical landscape from the perspective of the challenges India focuses with a focus on the regional challenges. So Pankaj sir, how, I mean, tell us, what worries you, what gladdens you, and what do you think are those aspects that India distinctly, urgently needs to do? Uh, thank you, firstly, uh, Sanjay, for hosting this uh, discussion along with uh, Mr. Rana Day. Um, you know, you talked about worries and uh, difficulties and what India needs to do more. There are many, many parts to this answer, but I'll just try to limit uh, the focus. I think as Mr. Ranade has said, uh, the global landscape, the main characteristic in my opinion, is that it is changing very fast and it is characterized by a lot of uncertainty. And this is both a challenge because we do not know what may happen in the future. So we have to be therefore extra prepared to deal with unforeseen events. But it is also an opportunity because as an emerging and a growing power, there is space for India to use difficulties and uncertainties to advance your own agenda, your own interests. So I would see this both as a positive and a negative. Frankly, to be honest with you, what worries me, and we have discussed in the previous session on the Indian economy, is that you know at the end of the day, you're as strong outside as you are inside. And unless and until, and as long as we are able to keep the focus on our internal strengths, not just numbers as was discussed, but you know, stability, social harmony, everything, we should be okay. So the main challenge, in my view, uh, to be strong outside and to be respected outside is to be good inside and, and actually um, ensure that the transformation of India takes place, number one, but it also takes place in a manner that doesn't threaten others and it also takes place in a manner that benefits the entire population. Excellent. Internal strength, cohesion, and internal power is essential before we can think of effectively projecting external influence. So with that as a start point, ladies and gentlemen, let us ask Jayadev sir for a subject that he has very deep understanding of. He's also a master of Mandarin, China. So a simple question, will it remain a forever enemy, sir? Or is it possible that it can become a potential friend in the long term? Answers to simple questions are not simple. <laughs> but, but let me say that uh, when you say, can it become a potential friend in the long term, how long a term are you talking about? 
Are you talking about when the Communist Party collapses in China? Are you talking about Xi Jinping's disappearance? Foreseeable future. Foreseeable future, I don't see a friendly China. Uh, in fact, as I said, it's going to be aggressive. It's expanding the areas un, uh, where it is putting us under pressure. Uh, and um, uh, I don't see them uh, becoming friendly uh, towards us. Certainly not, as long as Xi Jinping is the president. Excellent. And I'll just remind you that at the start of this term, his third term, uh, at the, on the opening day of the party congress, which is the major event, happens once in five years, policy is laid down, on the opening day, when the past, present, and future communist party leaders, as well as government leaders and military leaders are present, they screened on, on the, uh, in, the, in the Great Hall of the People a video clip of the clashes at Galwan. The message was very clear mm -hmm. that this is the relationship that we have with India and it's going to remain. And to underscore this, let me mention that China does Even not discuss foreign policy issues at the party congress. So there is a very clear meaning in that video clip that they showed. And also, the Galwan officer, they put as their Olympic torchbearer, which is when India had an objection to certain issues. So with that, Pankaj sir, coming back to you, spoke about the internal strength and the internal security. So I'd like you to share your views with us about the non-traditional threats to national security as one bucket and the internal security threats as a second bucket. So I think they both overlap to a lot, of, uh, to a great extent. Uh, I would just like to share this, use this opportunity to uh, share with uh, the audience that in the last few years, uh, there has been a very major and a significant evolution in the way in which India's national capability is being upgraded to handle all kinds of security threats, not going well beyond traditional security threats. And so the importance of national security in the overall government policy formulation yes. has definitely become much more salient than it had been earlier. Uh, earlier. So this fundamental recognition that national security or hard security is not a bad word. It is not anti-Gandhian. It is a requirement and an imperative of today's world in which we live. That is a big mental change that has happened in government. And so, you know, structures and all have been created to deal with this. What are these threats? Clearly, uh, you know, they go beyond traditional military threats. Uh, Mr. Ranade will be talking uh, later on about uh, the kind of threats we face from China. But there are other threats. I mean, there are threats of uh, coming from different domains today. Uh, it's just, you know, cyber, uh, space, uh, digital, uh, maritime. So these are different kinds of threats for which we need different responses and different skills and different capabilities. There is the threat of information warfare, psychological warfare. Then when you come to the internal situation, I would say, you know, one of the biggest threats India faces is regional imbalances between different regions of India. We face threats coming out of social harmony between different groups within India. We face the threat of climate change and the impact on the ecology, on the livelihood. These are the threats which we have to recognize, and not push under the carpet, and deal with them as national security threats. So when we talk of, let us say, uh, the resilience of the nation, uh, we have to go well beyond aggregate figures of you know, headline figures of the GDP growth or the value of the GDP. We have to look at inequalities. We have to look at empowerment. We have to look at uh, skill development. Uh, we have to remember that it's a, again, it's an internalization process. There is no one you can look up to as an example to solve your problems for the simple reason that today India is the largest country in the world by population. So there is no example to follow. We are sui generis. Every solution that we have to find has to be an Indian solution. You cannot copy what Singapore is doing or Korea is doing. 
you have to find your own solutions. Thank you for that. And two questions in my mind flowing from what you just said for Jayadev, sir. You spoke about information warfare and therefore influence operations. We are aware of the United Front Works Department of China and its influence operations within India and their detrimental effect on national security. So that's one issue I'd like you to share with the audience, sir. The second is in the non-traditional threats, there is definitely a water wars threat typically with the Brahmaputra and the Indus, the riparian issues. If you could tell our audience about those, sir. I'm glad you've touched on the United Front Work Department of the Chinese Communist Party. It's something that is a shadowy figure. Not many of us know about it, uh, or we don't want to acknowledge it. Uh, what they do, essentially, is try and, as they say, quote, unquote, win over friends uh, in various sections of society uh, of countries of their interest. So uh, since you spoke about India, let me mention there are four or five prime targets that they have. The first are the academics. So in many of the universities, they have approached the academics. Some of them are on their payrolls. Uh, the second are students whom they've targeted. Uh, students uh, generally are innocent. They wouldn't be aware of what's going on. The third are politicians, bureaucrats, and journalists are a very prime target too. So they approach them, and there are various ways in which they do it. I'll just give you a couple of examples because I know time is short. The first is, as far as academics are concerned, many of them do research on China, which means that they have to go on field trips. So what the Chinese do is first offer them visas or threaten to deny them visas, which will upset their entire PhD program. So therefore, they go soft on whatever they write on China. The second is they offer them trips to China in order to, as they say, facilitate their research, which they happily accept. So they're getting whatever grants they're getting, but they're also getting this. And once they're there, the Chinese request them to uh, give a few lectures and arrange their field trips for them. So uh, obviously the end result is that they come back pretty satisfied with uh, what has happened. Sir, please continue. Sorry for the interruption, please continue, sir. So, so they come back uh, pretty satisfied with what has happened without realizing that actually they're uh, advancing China's agenda. The same thing happens with the other sections. So for example, journalists go, uh, are go very often. They're usually given, uh, I mean, everything is paid for on their trips and their articles when they come back are soft articles, which they write. They approach educational institutions, and I, I won't mention the name, but there was one very recently in Maharashtra where they went. It was a tier three town, they selected a school, went and met the school teacher. Now you can imagine a tier three town school teacher is not going to be very uh, well acquainted with international affairs. And uh, they promised to help the school. They gave a donation. Uh, they promised books, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this is the way they are penetrating a country. The, in India, we are late, we were late to wake up to it. We've just started looking at this as an issue. And I can mention that uh, I run a think tank, incidentally, which you know. Uh, when we raised this uh, United Front, um, uh, the threat of United Front at one of our conferences, uh, people were quite surprised that uh, this was happening under our very noses. The second thing you mentioned was uh, about non-conventional threats in terms of water. That's a very big threat. Um, just to give you an example and to put a little context, the Chinese have been thinking about irrigating their north, which, is, which has a lot of arable land, but it's water stout. So they decided on diverting the Brahmaputra River and pushing it to the north. And um, there was a lot of uh, denial. There was a lot of uh, reluctance to take it up with the Chinese, etc. But finally, we did. But uh, they denied it. Now the plans are out. Uh, and the plans are still not conclusive to our mind. But they've decided on 17 dams along the Brahmaputra, or Yarlung Sangpo, as they call it, to divert it. And this includes one major dam, which will be the largest in the world. It's bigger than the Three Gorges Dam, which today is the largest in the world. 
and it involves um, what they call a minor nuclear decretation. I'm quoting their language at the Great Bend, which is where the uh, Brahmaputra no, turns yeah. into India. And according to them, once they do that, they'll build a hydroelectric power plant there, and that will generate enough electricity for the entire Southwest China and Tibet. So that is their grand plan. Now, if this happens, uh, whether they do this grand hydro pro project or not, with those dams along the Bra uh, Brahmaputra, the flow of water will reduce. Now, they've tried to say it's run of the river, but these are the same people who denied that there was a dam coming up till we showed them satellite photographs. So uh, I don't go by that run of the river. But even if it were, 17 dams of that type would reduce the flow of water. It would cause heavy siltage. And there is an argument that m there's more rainfall once the river turns yes. rather than before. before. But if the river itself has reduced to a trickle, will that rainfall help or will it change the uh, course? So these are all issues that are coming up. And we have the example of what they're doing with the Mekong, where they're refusing to talk to the Mekong River countries. Yes. And I anticipate that will be the attitude here. So this is another threat that we face. In addition to, of course, the developmental activities in Tibet, which are raising the temperatures in Tibet and which are accelerating the receding of the glaciers. And uh, let me just uh, remind others here that all the rivers that flow into India and, in fact, in, in uh, Asia are glacier fed and from Tibet. From the Tibet so that's going Island, to cause yes. a problem. So you would also remember that in 2017 Doklam crisis, we had floods. Because when we requested China for data so that we get advanced information of floods, it was denied to us. And yet, a further downstream country, Bangladesh, had that data from China. So that is the degree of this threat, how real it is, what is being brought out. Some other non-conventional, when Sir spoke about the educational threats, please Google Confucius Institutes. They are world over and what America has done with them. In fact, the ambush and the killings in Pakistan, or was it in Afghanistan, where the Confucius Institute people were killed in the cab by the local terrorists, Afghanistan. On the non-traditional threats, please remember that we had a major power outage. And we've had infiltration into banking sector, uh, computer networks. These are only pointers. And capabilities we can well assess. And these are the systems we need to harden. Wars will not only be fought by soldiers on the front. So all this has been brought out. Jayadev sir, I want to Put it in simple terms, India's relationship with China and India's relationship with America. America wants India in the Western camp, understandable. Equally understandable is India is no, in no hurry to go into the American camp. So how does India balance its relations with these two superpowers, America and the emerging one, China. The balance that India needs to do and the challenges in that balance. Well, I think uh, <clears throat> at the moment, we are playing it well. The Americans certainly want us on their side. I don't think they are in a position to take the Chinese on alone. But having said that, in my opinion at least, the real big showdown if I may call it that, or the real contest is, is between the United States and China. Mm -hmm. And that's for the number one position. The Chinese have made it very clear that by 2049, they want to be the global power. Their 100 year celebration, 1949 yeah. to 2049. Whereas the Americans, I think, are equally clear that they don't want to yield that position. So that's going to be the showdown, where the Americans certainly want us on their side. We have no reason at the moment to side with the Chinese, but we are trying to keep them guessing whether we will go or not. Uh, so I think that's the uh, situation. But the Chinese, if I may say so, despite a popular myth that the Chinese are infallible, they made a series of mistakes. The first strategic miscalculation was what they did with us in April 2020. 
Galwar. by coming into uh, Ladakh and then Galwar. I think that is something we are not going to forget for a long, long time. They've uh, destroyed all trust between us. Uh, so that's one. The second is uh, the manner in which they're pushing us on other fronts in international fora, including by telling international organizations not to depict Arunachal, etc., on their maps or in their reports because that uh, territory is disputed, and to not uh, permit aid to go to poverty elevation projects in these places. Now, these are things which uh, go against, I would say, even humanitarian grain, but they're being done, so we are tackling them. But by doing this, what China is doing is actually ensuring that we are not going to back them, which is why you'll find a uh, shall I say, not hardening, but a more clear position on Quad, et cetera, coming out yes. uh, with us. So I would just say that at the moment, we are balancing them. And I think when the time comes, we'll have to take a call. Uh, but till we can balance them, that's what we'll do. We have enough other problems with Nepal, Maldives, et cetera. I'm coming to, to that do. itself, sir. Would you like to share just now Maldives, a new president, Muzo, the next day he wants the Indian defense people there which are manning the helicopters for them for their good for their search and rescue he wants them out then there is a major three ministers of theirs speak against mr modi in a disrespectful language and against our country and the next day this new president goes for his first ever visit to china and now when he comes back today's papers have it that he's talked about we may be a small country but you can't bully us with without you naming india so all the challenges that we were speaking about, these other countries around us, if you could call them the SARC countries, et cetera, how do you view these challenges to India's strategic position? No, I think uh, when you look at our overall national security, uh, one of the fault lines or the black and white between internal security issues and external security issues has now almost uh, disappearing fast. Blurred. Yeah. Because uh, one impacts the other, and the other impacts uh, the first. And this is most evident in our immediate neighborhood, the Indian immediate periphery. So on the Maldives, I, yes, what you're saying is true, but I would like to see it in a slightly uh, bigger frame, which is, you know, you have your neighbors. They're all smaller than you. And that's the reality of geography. Some of them are very unsure about their identity and the national identity vis-a-vis -vis India. Clearly, all of them, their national power is much, much smaller than yours. So they have to come to terms with how to deal with a huge elephant right next to them. They will therefore evolve. They will have elections. There will be governments. They will uh, have governments which are in favor of India. They will have governments which are uh, opposed to India. This is the cycle of life uh, that we will live through. Till yesterday, you had a very friendly government in the Maldives. Today, you have this kind of a government. Day after tomorrow, you may have something else. The question is whether we respond to each in an episodic fashion, or we sit back, take a deep breath, and look at the history and the future, and create you know, structural solutions on how India should deal with even the smallest and the tiniest neighbor. You can't, you know, you can't treat them as equals because they're not equal. You, there is an emotional quotient. There was a session yes. here. Mm. It applies even to foreign affairs. And uh, that applies even to the largest and the most powerful countries. So we have to have a more structured and a more dispassionate approach on how to deal with our neighbors. We have to be ready to take the good with the bad. We have to decide how to respond when situations are not good and how to respond when situations are good. I think extreme reactions are counterproductive. Uh, there are limits to power, which even the United States has realized, that even with a tiny Palestinian, which we discussed yesterday, there is only that much the Americans can do. So this is the reality of life. How much can you push a small person to the back to the wall? So I think when it comes to the immediate neighborhood, uh, we have to keep this in mind. 
and uh, develop methodologies, uh, develop solutions on how we can tackle every situation as we see it. And what best can we do to ensure that our smaller neighbors maintain and respect the geographical reality that they are next to us. Next to us. And that we have helped them in every time they You wanted to say something. To say yeah. <laughs> going from what he said, uh, is that as our economy improves, I think uh, the, uh, we, our um, approach towards these smaller countries, our ability to win them over and keep them with us will uh, improve because it will help to keep the Chinese at bay. The ones we have deeper pockets, we can help them more and buy influence. And I think Sir gave a very mature response that our response need not be episodic. Sit back, make policy decisions, mature responses with consistency of long-term strategic approach is what Mr. Pankaj Saran was talking about. And I at least individually fully endorse it, which is not what your TV channels want in their TRP hungry sensationalization issues. So now I want to ask both of you, do you want audience questions first or you want to give your closing remarks first? <laughs> audience, how do you want it? <laughs> okay, so going by seeing Mr. Pankaj Saran in the previous three sessions, he's got an excellent memory. So he, you know, he takes three questions at a time and he's able to remember all three and they can respond between them. So what I will request you, Please keep your questions short. Sorry for being rude, but sometimes the question is longer than the answer. answer. So introduce yourself, a brief about your background, and then your question. If you raise your hand, I will indicate, and a mic will come to you, and then you please speak. OK. OK. Who's the next who wants a question? OK, there's a brick bright hand there I've seen, and there's one there. No. So see this hand? Yes. Okay, okay, you're the fourth one, ma'am. First, here, please ask. Second, there. Third, there. And after these three, we'll have the lady who's asked from here. Yeah. Uh, sir, what you have talked, I'm Colonel M.K. Tiagi, retired in 2005, staying in Bhopal. And when Mr. Raghav Chandra was the, here in the state, we had to, I had an uh, interaction with him also. Thank you, sir, for organizing these sessions. We are loving it. So my question is to Mr. Ranade. We have talked about the immediate neighbors, but what is what most of us are seeing, the South China Sea as the next flashpoint of the world. There, the smaller countries like Philippines, Taiwan, are being bullied by China. China does not respect the modern laws of so the So what today. is the question? My question is, how do you contain and should we react the way we are reacting as it is bullying Philippines and Taiwan or we should sit back and think, let it happen the way it is happening. Thank that's, you. Good question. That's really an uh, issue between the two major contestants, which is the United States and China. The United States has treaty agreements with the Philippines, with Japan. It has given a kind of a moral, I mean, they will deny it, but a kind of a moral uh, commitment to the Taiwanese that they'll come to their aid. There's been a bit of going back and forth on that to create uh, strategic deniability. But uh, I see no reason why we should, uh, shall I say, display our cards right now. Uh, let uh, things develop. If Xi Jinping decides that he has enough trouble on his plate in, at home, he might decide to divert attention and undertake an adventure, which, which is when the United States will have to take a call whether it steps in or not. Chances are it will step in. As far as Japan is concerned, Philippines are concerned, and Vietnam is concerned, let me assure you, they're no friends of the Chinese. They're trying to uh, sort of play along with the Chinese at present. But once the US comes in, the situation will change. And at that time, we'll have to see how we, uh, which side we will go with. It's, I think, very clear which side we'll go with. We have already signed a number of agreements with the Americans. Those will be uh, brought into effect. So we will certainly become a player. Whether we are going to be an active player or a passive player will depend on how the circumstances unfold. Thank you. Next question. And we'll change the order instead of there. This lady has to go. It seems she's signaling. So she can ask the third question. 
Yes, please. Hi, sir. Good evening. So my question is like uh, America is a state and uh, they use their op yeah and they use their sanctions like Konkasa on uh, into their interest. So uh, will India uh, also be uh, crafting such a sanctions we can put on China and realize? The question has to be repeated with a better mic or you can come forward. Come forward. Yeah, sure, take my mic. Sir, so my question was that uh, America is a powerful state. They use this like sanctions and um, to oppress uh, the countries who... Sir, anything? Okay. Sir, like America have their powerful sanctions like Kumkasa. So as an India is also a powerful country now. So can we impose or can we craft such sanctions like Kumkasa? So we can impose it on China and their allies who are against their, uh, against our interests and policies. I think both of us will have to respond to that. But uh, let me just <coughs> say that uh, firstly, uh, US has imposed sanctions on a number of countries and uh, the assessment is that it hasn't worked, um, including on Russia. Second, I think the power imbalance between us and China is such that we are in no position to really impose sanctions on them, much as we would like to, but we are not in a position like that. So when things improve, maybe. But over to you. Yeah. No, I, firstly, Konkasa is not a sanction. So just, I think what you mean is probably Katsa. But um, uh, on, on the sanctions, you know, um, it is not India's policy to impose sanctions, number one. Number two, we are not yet as powerful as the United States or China to impose sanctions on other countries. Uh, we have other methods uh, where we have problems. You know, we've done a few things with Nepal in the past uh, and so on, where we've had difficulties. But we are not yet at the stage where we can introduce uh, sanctions. Also, we do not believe in uh, unilateral sanctions. Next question, please. Sir, so I would like to ask a question that I completely agree that episodic reactions are definitely a kind of an emotional outburst that we place on the global platform. But I would like to ask in context to the SAR countries, is time ticking? as we keep waiting on the fence, thinking and deliberating on our policy and before the other person takes an action? It's, um, I, I'm not quite sure exactly uh, who are you targeting, but uh, within SARC. Sir, I'm, I'm targeting in relation to Maldives, as you said ah, that, you okay. know, kind of an episodic reaction, but is time ticking as we wait on the fence to decide our policy and deliberate? It's. You know, in, in foreign affairs, there are some actions and some decisions you can take instantaneously. And there are some that, and sometimes not taking a decision is also a conscious decision. And in the case of uh, the Maldives, um, right now we are doing some things with the government of Maldives directly. They obviously have chosen to go public on many aspects. So the decision we have to take is, do we do a tit for tat in the public domain? And do we, do we express our disagreements through the media? Or we let tempers cool down a little bit? Because the geographical reality and the cultural reality and everything else is such that it stares in the face of every Maldivian. He knows it. And that also adds to his sense of helplessness against India. So the question here becomes, what kind of a personality do you want to show to the Maldives? Because everyone is watching. Till yesterday, for example, we had very difficult relations with Sri Lanka. But when the economy tanked and collapsed, we were the first to go in. So in foreign affairs, and particularly in the neighborhood, you have to be nimble, dexterous, patient. Sometimes you have to show the anger. Sometimes you have to hide your anger. This is all part of the trade and the craft. Let me give you a small specific on this show the anger. 
when this happened, thereafter, on, I think it was on the 9th that the Maldives High Commissioner was called to the Foreign Office, the Indian MEA. Do you know how long he took? How much time the MEA gave him? I wrote in the morning, five, I wrote four minutes. And in the evening, this came on the evening news with the time ticker. His car came in at 9.35 and his car drove off at 9.40 in the morning. Imagine the walking time from getting off the car to going up to the concerned office. All inclusive, five minutes. This is showing anger very politely. Now, next question there. Hello, sir. Myself, Ankit Sarma. Uh, sir, if you don't have to ask Hindi, I want to ask you a question. भाषा मात्र माध्यम है विचारों के आदान प्रदान का मैं भी बड़ी क्लिष्ट हिंदी बोलता हूँ अवश्य पूछें सर जैसा अभी कुछ रिपोर्ट्स सामने आती हैं और आरोप लगते हैं कि भारत में ही रहके कुछ मीडिया संस्थान जो हैं वो भारत विरोधी एजेंडा चीन के इशारे पर चलाते हैं क्या हमारी जब आंतरिक सुरक्षा की बात अभी आपने की कि काफी मजबूत है तो इस मजबूत आंतरिक सुरक्षा के बीच ऐसा संभव है और यदि ये संभव है तो ये देश के लिए कितना खतरनाक हो सकता है संभव है और वही मैं कह रहा था यूनाइटेड फ्रंट वर्क डिपार्टमेंट जो है वो ये मीडिया हाउसेस जो है उनको विन ओवर कर रही है तो एक दो मीडिया हाउसेस ऐसे हैं यहां पे जिनको काफी शैले से लार्ज साइज्ड एडवर्टाइजमेंट्स मिलते हैं तो बहुत मुनाफा कमाते हैं वो उसमें वो एक तरीका है विन ओवर करने का दूसरा है उनके जर्नलिस्ट को वो टारगेट करते हैं तो सब तो नहीं बट अगर दो तीन चार जर्नलिस्ट मिल गए तो वो मीडिया हाउस का जो ओरिएंटेशन है वो बदल जाता है तो ऐसा जरूर होता है दो मीडिया हाउसेस मेरे ख्याल से हैं ऐसे जिन जिनके बारे में लोग जानते हैं और उनकी कोशिश ये है कि और को भी औरों को भी ऐसे करें पर ये चलता रहेगा ऐसा ऐसा नहीं है कि एक एक मीडिया हाउस को विन ओवर कर दिया तो छोड़ दिया और सरकार भी देख रही है आजकल देखिए इस पे मैं एक विचार और बता दूं लोकतंत्र की अपनी कुछ विशेषताएं होती हैं और कुछ ताकत होती है और एक गेम है जिसका नाम है जूजुत्सु जैसे कराटे होता है जूजुत्सु में क्या होता है शत्रु की ताकत शत्रु के विपरीत इस्तेमाल करी जाती है मैं कमजोर हूं लेकिन शत्रु शत्रु की ताकत उसी के ऊपर इस्तेमाल करूंगा तो लोकतांत्रिक देश की जो मजबूतियां हैं फ्रीडम ऑफ स्पीच वगैरह वगैरह ये इस टाइप के शत्रु इन हमारी लोकतांत्रिक फ्रीडम्स को अपने उसमें इस्तेमाल करने में पी है अगले सवाल के लिए एनी क्वेश्चन आपका एक और कोई ओके okay, एक नीली शर्ट में इधर एक मैम इधर तो ये आपने सबसे पहले हाथ उठाया था आपको माइक दीजिए उसके बाद ऊपर उधर नीली कमीज और इधर मैम को पहले इधर गुड इवनिंग एवरीवन सर माय क्वेश्चन इज वेरी सिंपल इन टू पार्ट्स हु इज रियल थ्रेट फॉर अस चाइना और पाकिस्तान who is re real threat for us china or pakistan or we are a developing economy if we are forced a war are we competent can we handle can we are we competent right now can we handle that's all thank you yo <coughs> question about uh, if a war is thrust on us can we respond uh, if it's thrust on us we have no choice but to respond and I think you have just seen an illustration which is continuing it started in April 2020 when the Chinese came to our border there are now 70,000 troops deployed by each side along the entire border that just that does show a willingness a resolve and an ability to hold the line and keep the other person at bay. Plus, a willingness that if shots are fired, then we will also respond. So I think on that, there is no doubt to my mind. And in today's wars, I don't think uh, it's going to be a quick and easy victory. I think the Chinese planning that they'll have a short, swift, decisive war is, uh, you know, they're living in a fool's paradise. It's going to be long. 
it's going to be bloody, it's going to be protracted. In other words, they'd have, got, they'd have lost the war. Because as far as we are concerned, if we inflict even a bloody nose on them, we won. They have to really defeat us. So that's one. Uh, your first part, which is a bigger threat, China or Pakistan, if you speak to the people who spoke at the last session, they will say Pakistan. <laughs> but in my view, it's China which is the threat. It's multiple times larger, stronger uh, than uh, Pakistan. And um, it's bigger than us. I don't think Pakistan is a threat. We have magnified it in our minds. It's actually a small country. We should have dealt with it over the years. We made a mistake. And we misread the Chinese. That's the second mistake that we made. So I don't think, uh, and let me just end with one comment. It's a personal anecdote. I was sitting with a Chinese friend some years ago. Of course, as you said, in the evening after 6 p.m. <laughs> they also indulge. And uh, I asked him, I said, what are you really doing with this China-Pakistan economic corridor? Is it worth it? Is it viable? So he looks at me and he says, you know, Mr. Ranade, till now we had bought the Pakistanis. Now we are going to buy Pakistan. So keep that in the back of your mind when you wow. <laughs> What a good answer. Till now we had bought the Pakistanis, now we'll buy Pakistan. Yeah, please, next question. Uh, Commander Chakravati here. So my uh, question to uh, Dr. Renade is... You are the space expert. <laughs> no. I'm okay, go continue. Uh, okay. okay. So uh, uh, my question is, there is a general uh, sort of agreement or uh, consensus in lots of quarters that uh, the, ch the Chinese will make the move on Taiwan by 2027. So wh what is your assessment of this? And the second part of it is, if they do in this time period, which is we are in 2024, three years, what should be our response being part of the Quad? And how do we, uh, if, this, if they move, so how do we, uh, where do we throw our cards? This 2027 is an assessment or a projection made by the Americans based on the fact that the PLA, which is the People's Liberation Army, completes 100 years of its founding on, in 2027. Also, the fact that Xi Jinping, the Chinese president, advanced the date for their modernization from 2030 to 2027. So the, I think these are the two indicators that they had in their mind. Whether Xi Jinping actually moves against Taiwan or not will depend on his determination of whether the US will intervene or not intervene in a clash. Remember, it's an amphibious operation, which is a very complicated operation that they will undertake. The second is that they will have to mobilize at least their entire eastern seaboard for this operation. And the third is that while in the newspapers you will read that the Americans have to come a long distance, you know, the British will have to mobilize, etc. We forget the fact that they've got precision guided missiles. So they don't have to move their ships as such up there. And they, in any case, they're already deployed. They've got uh, bases all around. So it's not going to be an easy decision for Xi Jinping. Having said that, let me just say that Xi Jinping today is facing a lot of problems at home. And if he decides to divert attention, then he may undertake an adventure like this. But he may also decide to take one of the outlying islands and stop there. Then we will see, there was another question about sanctions, whether the Americans will apply sanctions. That we'll have to see. But I think these are the scenarios, and I think his own army is probably telling him that let's wait a while, let's get organized before we mount an operation. Next question, please. Okay. My question is कि आज पूरी दुनिया जो है वो red sea की red sea की problems को face कर रहा है होती इस problem और जब इसके context में resolution लाया गया UN में तो China और Russia दोनों ने back out किया है और India ने सबसे ज़्यादा अपने warships भेजे तो ये जो इस तरीके का behaviour है China और Russia का दोनों का इस context में उसके लिए आप क्या कहेंगे and the second छोटा सा question है कि China एक ऐसा पहला country बन गया है जिसने Taliban को resolution दिया है और offer किया है उसे part बनने का BRI Belt and Road Initiative का तो इस पे thank you sir नहीं जो अभी जो Red Sea में हुआ है और जो China और Russia का जो रवैया है उसके ऊपर actually it has less to do with Red Sea more to do with the China US and Russia US geostrategic competition तो जो भी अमेरिका करता है उसका ऑपोजिट ये लोग करते हैं तो चाहे वो यूक्रेन में हो चाहे रेड सी में हो चाहे और भी कहीं जगह हो जो भी चीज़ 
इनका जो टेंशन इतना बढ़ गया है चाइना और अमेरिका और रशिया और अमेरिका के बीच में कि जो भी मसला जो भी हॉटस्पॉट है दुनिया में अगर वो एक अगर अमेरिका सोचता है उनको नुकसान होगा तो अमेरिका वही करेगा अगर चाइना और रशिया सोचते हैं कि अगर मैं ये पोजीशन लूँ और उसमें अमेरिका का ज़्यादा नुकसान है तो वही वही करेगा सो so, जो इंडिया कह रहा है एज अ ग्लोबल साउथ वगैरह कि अगेन लाइक इन द कोल्ड वॉर यू आर यूजिंग स्मॉल कंट्रीज रीजनल हॉट रीजनल टेंशन to fight your bigger battles so i don't think we should uh, uh, it is not so much on the merits of the conflict in the red sea but more on how to make dis uh, create discomfort for the americans on the other question i couldn't understand on the bri and taiwan taliban oh the taliban acha sorry i heard taiwan <laughs> नो तालिबान दैट इज अगेन यू नो चाइनीज ऑपरचुनिज्म जो चाइना ने मौका देखा है कि अमेरिकन हैव गॉन दे हैव बीन डिफीटेड अब तालिबान आ गया है एंड अफगानिस्तान चाइना का बॉर्डर ऐसा है कि जो अफगानिस्तान के अंदर जो टेररिस्ट ग्रुप्स हैं खासतौर से शिनचियांग में द लॉट ऑफ दम आर बेस्ड इन अफगानिस्तान तो चाइना ये समझ रहा है कि उसके लिए एक मौका है टू मेक फ्रेंड्स विद द करंट न्यू रेजीम इन काबुल सो दे रीचिंग आउट टू दैम हम भी काम कर रहे हैं अफगानिस्तान के साथ लेकिन हमने रिकग्नाइज नहीं किया है ये डिप्लोमेटिक नाइसिटी है बट अफगानिस्तान भी चाहता है कि भारत जो है वो अफगानिस्तान में दोबारा घुस जाए और प्रोजेक्ट्स करे और डेवलपमेंट करे बट अगेन दिस इज़ अ चाइना यू एस कॉन्टेस्टेशन एंड गेम विच द टू आर प्लेइंग एंड अफगानिस्तान इज़ वन मोर थिएटर अब मैं हमारे दोनों वरिष्ठ विशेषज्ञों से निवेदन करूंगा कि वो अपने अपने अंतिम टिप्पणी करें और उसके बाद हम इस सत्र को समाप्त करेंगे सो एज वी वर सेइंग आई थिंक एट लीस्ट टू माय माइंड इट्स वेरी क्लियर दैट द मेन थ्रेट दैट इंडिया फेसेस एंड आई एम कॉलिंग इट अ थ्रेट Uh, is from china it's a multiple uh, multi dimensional threat that we have not only on the land but uh, at sea uh, in the skies by uh, from cyber uh, so we have a uh, multi layered threat uh, from the chinese which we have to tackle but uh, i do want to make one point which i think may be slightly out of course uh, maybe we've heard a lot of talk about uh, the economic imbalance between india and china about how uh, we are dependent on them etc i think that is not really the right way of looking at it we are behind the chinese in economic terms certainly uh, we have a lot of indicators where we are lagging behind but that doesn't necessarily mean that we are weak uh, it it what it does mean is that we have to decide or we have to prioritize the areas that we are going to focus on that is the first point i'd like to make so it's not a game over kind of situation the second is that when we talk of being dependent on china for imports i think that's a wrong way of looking at it that's the mistake that we made when we allowed mobile phones in india uh we did not work out a policy we allowed mobile phones to be imported and assembled and sold so you had chinese products we never developed these on our own we talked of cyber we began training people in software but the our best people in high end design of chips are sitting abroad or they are sitting in small little outfits in bangalore producing for honeywell corporation etc of the united states we have not co-opted them we have not brought them into our net and we haven't worked on scale similarly we did not work on developing the hardware capacity that we need to do that's something in fact pankaj you remember we talked about it we haven't done it so that is why we are dependent someone made a remark that if we don't get x mineral or whatever our mobile system is off well let me bring home to you one fact that if today the chinese get upset with you they can switch off your mobiles because all your mobile phones the backroom operators of whether it is vodafone airtel whatever are chinese companies so all they have to do is switch it off and you you are immobilized you have no communications 
So these are the threats that we have to plan for and look for. And I think we have started in the right track. It'll take us about five odd years, maybe 10 years, but by then we'll be independent. But we need to start on this, um, you know, move towards being independent of uh, other countries, particularly in vital sectors. So I just wanted to make this point before we go away with a bit of a gloomy mindset. No, I, I agree uh, completely. Um, you know, TikTok, one estimate that existed uh, was that before it was banned, it had 40 crore followers in India. It's like 400 million people and mostly in tier two, tier three rural India. So, and the penetration of the software uh, is another uh, major issue. The Chinese dictum is today how to win a war without fighting a war. And the Chinese threat to India is not just on the Tibetan plateau in terms of its military, etc. It is much more in terms of how they will exploit India's fault lines. We have fault lines. China also has fault lines. They have problems in Tibet and Xinjiang, everywhere else. So the Chinese threat is there. But the question is, can India and China as two ancient civilizations live together in peace? There will be no greater political or a global um, crisis than a full-fledged India-China war. That is a major, major scenario. So I think what we have to ask ourselves and talk to the Chinese is, what is your vision of Asia? Is it that China sits on the top and everyone is subsidiary to you? Or do you want an Asia in which everyone is equal? That the Chinese civilization, the Indian civilization, can we both coexist? We cannot be you and you cannot be us. You have your strengths, we have our strengths. Second is, as Mr. Ranade says, today in the government, and it has been going on this process for the last 15 years, predates the current government, but it is accelerated under the current government. As I mentioned to you, we are not shy today anymore of developing our hard security capabilities, which is what the Chinese discovered in 2020. The amount, the scale, the speed, and the determination of the military mobilization by India against the Chinese ingress was something which they had not even foreseen. And it stopped them in their tracks. So we, and now the other aspect of this China business is that we want friends who can help us. And these friends are those countries who see the similar nature of the threat. We don't have to become allies, but we need friends. And those friends are countries such as the Americans, the Australians, the Japanese, the Koreans, the Japanese, the Europeans, etc. So we have a mix of uh, policy options on how to, we don't want a war with China. We don't want that. But we also want to tell the Chinese that we may be weak economically, but we are determined. And we will maintain our basic uh, identity, basic positions. We will not be cowed down by threat. And we also want to live in an Asia which is respectable and which respects every country, whether it is the Maldives or India or China. But we will not accept a second rate or a second grade status in the Asian region. That's really, so the issue today is of a civilizational uh, competition or contest between India and China. S Sorry? And that, uh, Pankaj, is the difficult thing, and that is the crux of it. Uh, you know, being able to live with respect. Because the Chinese believe in one thing, there can only be one tiger on the mountaintop, and that's them. So, ladies and gentlemen, it remains for me to thank these two distinguished domain specialists and, of course, to thank all of you. Give them and yourself a good hand. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I have enjoyed it. We've enjoyed it too, Brigadier Agarwal. And rightly said that we need friends to manage China. However, China is not our friend in foreseeable future, as you rightly pointed out. Well, this was a session, China forever enemy or potential friend. We thank our distinguished panel for this engaging and informative session. I would now request Ms. Gitanjali J. Angmo, 
co-founder and director, Himalaya Institute of Alternatives in Ladakh, to felicitate our distinguished panel. Mr. Jaydev Ranade, a former additional secretary, research and analysis wing, and a seasoned China analyst with over 40 years of experience. Mr. Pankaj Saran, former ambassador to Russia and Indian High Commissioner to Bangladesh. And Brigadier Sanjay Agarwal, former security advisor to the Union Ministry of Home Affairs and advisor to government of Seychelles.